My name is Leilani Munter. Hi, Leilani. Nice to meet you. I am a professional race car driver and an environmentalist. Now I know what you're thinking. Race car driving is far from eco-friendly. I completely agree, and that is exactly what I intend to change. When I die in the name of the rest, gonna go to the place that's the best. I've always felt the need to go fast. When I was a little girl, it was horses. But then I got behind the wheel of a car. This is the thing about racing, is it is so addictive. At the age of 16, I received a letter from the state of Arizona saying that I was a danger to society after receiving an excessive number of speeding tickets. Apparently, they didn't appreciate my talent. They threatened to take my license away, I think, within a year of me getting my license. So I always was sort of racy. I always wanted to race people on the street. So I saved my money and went to racing school. I was the only female in the class. Shortly after one of our races, a pro team owner came out of the stands to inform me I had just beaten one of his professional drivers. That conversation changed my life. From there, I never looked back. Lonnie Munter is flat hooked up. She has just passed five cars in the last lap and a half. I was just talking to your spotter, Jacques Lazier, and he was pretty impressed with what you were doing. Tell us what happened. I, you know, I lost positions on the restart, but I was picking people off. I mean, I felt so good. My car was so solid. Being a female in a male-dominated sport, I sometimes get extra attention. You have that stereotype of, you know, is she here for drive or is she just here because she's cute and somebody wants to use her as a publicity stunt. And people aren't always happy about it. I did have a driver once and kind of get in my face and yell at me. He was really angry because one of the TV networks had come down to interview me. And he kind of was like, you know, I've been racing here for 10 years, and I've never had them come down here and interview me. What's so special about you? As I continue to prove myself in the Indy Pro Series, many of my critics will find themselves in the rear view. But there will always be those who suggest I maintain a low profile, especially off the track. But unfortunately, that is just not possible. <laughs> Even as a child, I was in love with nature. I could never understand how people could be so abusive to something so beautiful. And yet I didn't understand the severity of what lied ahead and the role I would eventually play in trying to make a difference. Then my sister Natasha married a musician named Bob Weir. He played in a band you might have heard of called The Grateful Dead. Well, the first day's not the hardest day, don't you worry. Bob was also passionate about protecting the environment, and he used his celebrity to actually make a difference. It was then that I realized that my love for driving and my love for nature were meant to intersect. So every time I run a race in the Indy Pro Series, I buy an acre of rainforest, of endangered rainforest to protect, to sort of offset the carbon footprint that I'm making by racing the car. I almost got hit by a butterfly. <laughs> I've now become politically active, challenging the leaders in my sport and on Capitol Hill to act now, to make the changes necessary to save our planet before it's too late. People are beginning to listen, but there is still so much work to be done, and I have to do my part. There is no question that race car driving is dangerous. 
it's a tough sport. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. <laughs> to be truly great, you have to be willing to put your foot on the gas at the very moment your body is begging you to hit the brakes. But I know that the more races I win, the more people will listen. And so I drive with a determination that comes from the deepest part of my soul, knowing there is more than one race to be won. I see the checkered flag, but my trophy cannot be held above my head. In the next 12 months, I will make racing history. I will fight to be one of a handful of women in the world to race at Indianapolis and Daytona, and I won't be happy with second place. I will invade corporate America and break new ground in bringing environmental sponsors to my sport. I will meet with other drivers one at a time, pleading with them to join me in the fight to bring all of American motorsports into a new era with the use of alternative fuels. As a former stunt woman and photo double for Katherine Zeta-Jones, I will use my Hollywood ties to influence more celebrities to raise their voice. I will knock down doors in Washington, D.C., and I promise I will be heard. Along the way, I will raise a few eyebrows, hit a few walls, and undoubtedly lose a few battles as I continue to wage a war. But I will never, ever give up. My name is Leilani Munter. I am a race car driver and an environmentalist, and I will change the world. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm so honored to, to join you all here. Um, so many amazing speakers these past couple of days. This is my first trip to, to Sun Valley. Thank you so much to Amy Christensen, who put all of this together. And I'm just really honored to be a part of your family of friends that gets to be here with you all. Um, so I know a lot of you, maybe when you saw race car driver, environmental activist on the, on the list, you probably thought, how in the world can those two things go together? Um, but before I was a race car driver, I was actually a biology graduate from the University of California in San Diego. And I'm really just your typical composting, rainwater collecting, electric car, and solar panel owning vegan hippie chick. <laughs> I just happen to also drive race cars. So ESPN Magazine once called me an oxymoron, the tree-hugging race car driver. I'm an uncommon messenger in the environmental world, I know that. Um, but I came across a quote from a man named Earl Bakken that helped make some sense of it for me. Earl said, by all reckoning, the bumblebee is aerodynamically unsound and should not be able to fly. Yet the little bee gets those wings going like a turbojet and flies to every little plant its chubby little body can land on. <laughs> Bumblebees are the most persistent creatures. They don't know they can't fly, and so they just keep buzzing around. <laughs> So much like the chubby bumblebee, I'm a race car driver that doesn't know I can't be an environmental activist, so I just keep buzzing around. After I graduated from college, I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, which is the epicenter of NASCAR racing, to pursue my career as a driver. I was definitely the odd one out. Not only was I a female driver in a male-dominated sport, but I was also what seemed like the only vegetarian and now vegan in the state of North Carolina. <laughs> I had more than a few people in NASCAR actually tell me that this must be the reason I was so short. The lack of meat in my diet <laughs> must have stunted my growth as I was growing up. <laughs> so it's safe to say it was difficult for some of the old school NASCAR boys to take seriously a female vegan driver um, as a competitor. But it was actually about to get worse because soon it was not just my gender and my diet that was setting me apart from the rest of the racing community. Over the past decade, I've become increasingly concerned, I think like all of you in this room, about the damage that's being done to our environment. In 2006, I took my personal concerns public 
when I started a section on my racing website dedicated to environmental news. And then in 2007, I announced my commitment to adopt and protect an acre of rainforest every time I sat in the car to offset the carbon footprint um, of the fuel that I had to burn. And I know that carbon offsetting is, is not the solution, but that was the only thing I could do about you know, the unavoidable emissions that I have to burn when I'm at the racetrack. So the more that I learned about our environmental challenges, the more that my racing website ended up being covered uh, with eco-facts about renewable energy and electric cars, um, green buildings, plant-based diet, and environmental legislation. And the reaction that I got from the public and the racing community was really strong um, from both sides of the fence. I remember in particular coming across an argument on a NASCAR forum. One member of the forum was very upset that I was promoting a movie called An Inconvenient Truth on my website. He, uh, he called me all kinds of names and said that I was brainwashed by Al Gore, and uh, others chimed in to agree with him. But then another member of the forum said, uh, have you actually seen the movie, and questioned, how can you judge the movie if you've never watched it? The thread became very long, and people were arguing back and forth. Some of them liked me and some of them hated me, um, but both sides were posting with passion. And once I got past the personal attacks on myself, I got a smile on my face and I thought, wow, I just started an argument about climate change on a NASCAR forum. <laughs> I guarantee you that this was the first time the people on that racing forum had argued about the parts per million of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. And that made me smile. I had started a dialogue, and that's the first step in creating change, is to start a dialogue between the two sides. And that really simple thing became something that was very important to me. I had sort of become a bridge between the environmental world and the racing world. And even if some people didn't like me for it, I felt like what was happening on that forum was bigger and much more important um, than my racing career. So I made a very important decision, and that was that I was going to talk about what I believed in, um, even if it landed me on the sidelines of the racetrack. I had finally made it to a level in my sport where my races were airing on TV, and I knew that was a huge opportunity, and I knew that I would be a fool to waste that opportunity. So if a sponsor didn't want to work with me because I promoted caring about planet Earth, um, then thanks, but no thanks. I don't want you on my race car anyway. I was told by many people in the racing world that I was making a big mistake, you know, that as a driver, I just needed to shut up, drive the race car, and plug my sponsors. Um, marketing people warned me that by talking about political and environmental issues, that I would alienate myself from companies that might want to sponsor my car, companies that might have CEOs that, that don't believe in climate change. And you know what I told them? I said the same thing that I had said years earlier to the people that told me that girls can't drive race cars. I said, screw you, watch me. <laughs> My decision was easy because I felt a greater kinship with the environmentalists and the activists than I did with the racing world. Racing had sort of made a transition inside of me, um, becoming something that I did in order to get my causes in front of a large group of people um, rather than just for the love of speed, which is how it started. If I wasn't driving for a greater cause, then the race itself really didn't mean anything to me anymore. Uh, the thrill of going 200 miles into a corner is still with me because it is incredibly fun. Um, but racing has become sort of a secondary pleasure to the deeper pleasure um, that I have in, in fighting for causes that I believe are the most important issues of our time. After I drew that line in the sand, something really cool started to happen. Um, I started to get calls from people who believed in the same things that I did. And uh, when, I, when I became the fourth woman in history to race in the Indy Pro Series, which was the, uh, the orange race car uh, that you saw in the video, I had a company that was named Smart Papers. Uh, there it is on my race car. Um, they were a leader at the time in the recycled paper industry. So since then, I have driven race cars promoting a future with 100% uh, renewable energy, solar power, wind power, LED lighting, an organization named Operation Free, which is a group of veterans fighting for clean energy on Capitol Hill, as well as two award-winning documentaries, 
Um, the first was the Cove car that I raced at Daytona, which is about the, the horrific slaughter of dolphins in Japan and the connection between that and the captive dolphin industry. And a CNN documentary you might have seen called Blackfish, which I raced at Talladega Super Speedway. Um, so I began traveling also to all of my races using an electric car, um, inviting the race fans to join me at the Tesla charging stations along the way to the racetrack so that they could learn more about electric cars and also see by example that long distance electric road trips are possible right now. Um, in 2014, my race, car, uh, my race team became the first team in history to power our pit box off of 100% solar power. Um, so my race car has kind of become a 200 mile an hour billboard to promote, uh, instead of products, shifts in our, our behavior uh, for the future of our planet and all of the species that we share our Earth with. There have been some negative consequences to my decision of putting my activism in front of my racing. Um, because I do not work with any companies that produce any sorts of fossil fuels, so no oil, no coal, no natural gas, uh, no companies that produce any meat or dairy products, fur or leather, and no companies that test on animals. Um, I certainly have a smaller pool of companies uh, that I can work with um, when you compare it to the other drivers on the track. In 2010, um, one of my renewable energy sponsors, Native Energy, had a customer complain about them supporting a race car driver. And Tom Rawls, their vice president of marketing, responded on their company website by saying this. How does Native Energy reach people who are, who are not already converts on the issue of climate change? Anyone who is engaged in any broad effort to speak to the public faces this question. Do I speak only to friendly audiences, or do I face the doubters and the hostiles? If we only address those who already agree with us, then nothing changes. And if we only work with people who believe in the same things that we do, then who is going to change the minds of those who don't? It is a more difficult conversation to have, um, but I believe it is also the most important conversation that we can have because this is how we move the needle. This is how we can create change. And I've gotten to see that change happen um, firsthand. I have had lifelong NASCAR fans ask me, how do you go about adopting your acre of rainforest um, for every race? This was a man who was a NASCAR fan and, and couldn't think of what to get his wife for her birthday. And he read about my rainforest program and thought that giving her an acre of rainforest in her name would make a, a pretty nice gift. So just because these race fans love fast cars and love racing does not mean that they don't care about planet Earth. Uh, liking fast cars and caring about the environment are not mutually exclusive events. So I'm now on a mission to green my sport. And as long as I can, I will continue to use my race car as a call to action to millions of race fans, hopefully inspiring them to change their day-to-day -day habits for our planet because those small changes, when multiplied by millions of people, can make a really big difference. I hope that my efforts will encourage the racing sanctioning bodies uh, to increase their environmental initiatives, and I will not stop until I see every racetrack powered by renewable energy, every sponsor taking responsibility for their effect on the environment, every racing tire recycled, and every race car abandoning fossil fuels for electricity or renewables. This is my mission, and some people think I'm crazy, and I know this because they send me emails. <laughs> but when I get discouraged, I remember these words from an old Apple Think Different computer commercial. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the one thing that you cannot do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward, and while some may see them as crazy, we see genius, because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. You will probably find, as I have, that the more you learn 
um, the more that your eyes open up not only to your impact, but the impact of everyone around you. Your awareness will be both a blessing and a curse, but with that burden of knowing comes the responsibility to educate those around you whose eyes have not yet opened. I'm gonna throw out my standard um, script here for just a moment to talk about an issue that I think is largely being ignored by the environmental community. I feel like human population is the big elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. When I was, thank you. When I was studying biology at University of California in San Diego, one of my biochemistry professors, I came in one day and he said, everybody close your books. We're not gonna talk about biochemistry today. And he played a film about population. I remember being so affected by this film that I walked all the way across the campus talking to this professor. Um, and there's one scene in Racing Extinction, for those of you that came to the movie last night, uh, where Luis Sohoyas, our director, I think, did a fantastic job of giving us the perspective of deep time. So deep time, 65 million years, it's a very hard thing to sort of um, understand conceptually. And he, so he showed a 24-hour clock that was the history of planet Earth. Where did man come in on that, on that time clock of 24-hour period? A couple seconds before midnight. In that time, we've destroyed half of the forests on Earth. In a year-long study done by uh, researchers at Cornell University, ecologists agreed that the ideal number of people that our planet can handle, um, with all of us living in relative prosperity, is two billion people. We currently have 7.4 billion people on the planet with a growth rate of over 200,000 people per day. And while it is the natural instinct for humans to breed, perhaps that we need to consider that one of the solutions to the problems that is facing our finite Earth is to not breed. David Penental, Cornell professor of ecology and systematics, who worked on this study said, quote, all the changes suggested to make life on Earth sustainable and prosperous are achievable with the currently available technologies. Less certain is the will of the people to change. My husband and I are child-free by choice for these reasons. I want more of us to feel comfortable talking about this issue, parents and non-parents, because we need to talk about this. And for the people who really can't deny that maternal or paternal instinct to be mothers and fathers, there are 132 million orphans in the world looking for homes. When I addressed overpopulation in Aspen last month, after my talk, I had these two beautiful young girls, Zoe and Anna, come and thank me for talking about orphans. They were both adopted. If my mother had her own children, Anna said, she would have never found me. Thank you for talking about the orphans. It means the world to me and so many others. Charles Darwin once said, it is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor is it the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. And so in the spirit of, Charwin, of Charles Darwin, I believe that it is time for us to utilize our intelligence to adapt and to change and to improvise the way that we are living on this planet. This generation has been called upon to answer the most noble of duties, to ensure the survival of future generations with the most basic of survival mechanisms, adaptation. In 2013, I made another step in my own evolution when I purchased my Tesla Model S. I know that the kind of life that I choose to lead is defined by the moral choices that I make every single day, and driving an electric car is a choice that I can be proud of. I have now driven over 38,000 miles on my Tesla, and with the solar panels on the roof of my house charging the car, I am quite literally driving on sunshine. As an environment, <laughs> thank you. And, and as an environmentalist, you know, driving fast cars has always sort of been my guilty pleasure. So this is the first time that now I can finally drive fast without the guilt of burning fossil fuels. And now the only time that I stop at gas stations is if I feel like flipping them off, <laughs> which occasionally I do. <laughs> this is on day one with my Tesla. 
and uh, I had been at the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, and I had been waiting to take that picture ever since. <laughs> so for the past four years, I've had the fantastic job of driving a one-of-a-kind Tesla Model S um, for a new documentary film called Racing Extinction from the Oceanic Preservation Society. This is the same team that made the Academy Award-winning film The Cove, which is actually the most winning documentary of all time. So Racing Extinction had its uh, television premiere on Discovery Channel in December, and we actually had 36 million viewers on that one weekend um, on Discovery Channel. So I know that some of you attended the screening last night, and so thank you so much um, for coming, but I know that there were also some dinners and other things going on. So for those of you that didn't make it to the film, I'm just gonna show you uh, the trailer really quick. What's happening now is unprecedented in Earth's history, why would we want to disrupt something that took billions of years to evolve? We need to fight it on all fronts. I think it's dawning on us now that this is the big one. OPS is a group I formed. It uses covert operations to expose harmed and endangered species. We're doing an order here. One bottle cam. Right there's the lens. Two buttonhole cameras. Check one, two. Oh, that's good. Just about everything endangered in the world is for sale in China. Look at this stuff. Endangered, highly endangered, highly endangered. The more illegal it is, the more you have to go to the back rooms. We're definitely not welcome here. Oh my gosh! There's things going on that are probably not safe to talk about. Climate is controlled by the ocean. And we're dumping so much carbon in the oceans, it can't take it anymore. Oh, we found this guy, Mr. Lee. He's culling and processing whale sharks. Nobody ever gotten a camera in there before. We run into people with badges and uniforms. Oh Strip God, off yeah. all this stuff. Throw it over a wall. Did you say the boss king shot oil? Jesus. This world is absolutely insane. Wildlife trade is second only to the drug market in the world. It's that lucrative. We need a getaway driver. And I knew one of the best. I love it. To create a heist, to hijack the world's attention. I think we want to put in an order for a car today. <laughs> Excellent, we'll take one. Blow the lid off this place, right? There's been five major extinctions in the history of the planet. This may be the sixth. When you're talking about losing all of nature, it's not a spectator sport anymore. Everybody has to become active somehow. The idea is to inspire people. Imagery is very powerful. If you can reach people, you can change them. We can make this happen. We need people to understand it's worth doing. People that have been in the business that don't even bother. But better to light one candle than curse the darkness. There's so many people who sit back and say we're screwed. But you know what? That one candle, maybe someone else with a candle will find you. And I think that's where movements are started. the movie last night um, you can rent Racing Extinction it's on iTunes and uh, Google Play and Amazon video um, so we're, we're facing a lot of environmental challenges and I still do believe that we can turn this this thing around um, whenever I feel sort of overwhelmed by the enormity of all the challenges that we're facing right now I remember this study that was done in 2011 um, where scientists wanted to find out if there was a tipping point uh, for the spread of ideas. The scientists found on the study that if just 10% of the population has an unwavering belief in an idea, that it is actually inevitable that the rest of the majority of the society accept that idea. And one of the scientists that worked on the study said he could see the idea really struggling very slowly to make it up to that 10%. But once it hit the 10% threshold, it spread like a flame. Um, so this study gives me hope because I do really believe um, that this 10% uh, threshold is possible for so many of the solutions um, that we already have. If we haven't already reached them, I think we're getting close. Um, so the three solutions that I'm most excited about right now um, is, is solar power, electric cars, and plant-based diet. And, and I know that most of you in here are already very familiar with the great strides that have been made with solar power and electric cars, but 
just with regards to the plant-based diet, um, I think it's important for us to note that more greenhouse gas emissions go into raising animals for food um, than the entire transportation sector put together. One third of the arable land on the planet is now being used to grow food that's being fed to livestock. It's an incredibly destructive and inefficient way of feeding ourselves. Um, so in May of this year, uh, Google's chairman, Eric Schmidt, talked to Fortune magazine. They wanted to know, you know what, what did he consider to be the most important trends in the tech industry. And uh, Eric Schmidt's pick for the number one most important tech trend in the world was plant-based meats. Um, so this is coming, and it's coming fast. Uh, the next race car that I'm working on is a vegan-themed race car, of course, <laughs> at Daytona in February. And um, I want to have a big tent um, full with vegan food that I'm going to give away to the race fans at the track, the kind of food that they would find at the racetrack, but just uh, vegan versions of it. And by the way, um, if you're doubtful that this is going to be successful, I have already converted some of the guys on my race team and my pit crew to start eating vegan meats. Um, so it is possible. Um, after that race, I'm actually considering making the move to a new electric car series. It's a GT series um, that's in the works right now. Um, it should be starting in Barcelona next summer, and it's using a highly modified Tesla race car. Um, so they're using rear wheel drive Tesla P85 pluses, which is the same kind of car that I drive in the film and I drive at home. Um, so since I know that a lot of you guys work in the finance world, an investment world, I wanted to throw it out there in case you know any companies that are interested in sponsoring me to finally make the switch to an electric car racing series in this electric GT series in Europe. Um, okay, so let me uh, go to the next slide here. My name is Leilani Munter and I am a woman. I am a race car driver and a biologist. I am an environmental activist and a wife. I am a sister, a daughter, and a scuba diver. And while I do each of these things to the betterment of myself, on my very best days, I am a catalyst for change outside of myself. And that is the core reason why I exist. I pledge to each of you here today to use my voice as a driver to spread environmental awareness and encourage change as much as I can. I must warn you that as a woman, the odds are stacked against me. If you listen to statistics, as a woman, I'm actually more likely to be sent into space than I am to ever race on the top level of NASCAR. But like the chubby bumblebee that doesn't know it can't fly, I just keep buzzing around. On my long strange journey, I've met other bumblebees buzzing around and making a difference. One of them was a wonderful lady named Wangari Matai. She was the first African woman in Central or Eastern Africa to earn her PhD. Her husband divorced her in 1977 and was quoted as saying she was too educated, too strong, too successful, too stubborn, and too hard to control. <laughs> Which is why I think she was absolutely fantastic. It was around this time that Wangari started an organization called the Green Belt Movement out of her home. And the Green Belt Movement has now planted over 51 million trees in Kenya. When someone from the Clinton administration came to visit, her house was so crowded with volunteers that she had nowhere to offer him to sit. And in 2004, when she received the call that she had won the Nobel Peace Prize, becoming the first environmentalist to do so, she put her phone down, went outside her home, and planted a tree. Wangari planted a tree any time that she had something to celebrate in her life. Wangari once said, it's the little things that citizens do. That's what will make the difference. My little thing is planting trees. And so I hope that each of you will go out and find your little thing if you haven't already. Just pick one thing. Whatever it is that you have a passion for, find it, nurture it, be a bumblebee with me, and together we will change the world. Thank you.